Madam Speaker, first of all, I'd like to thank members for this debate. Two weeks ago, when I decided to bring this matter to Parliament, I explained my purpose. To air fully all the accusations against me and my government. To allow MPs to raise difficult and inconvenient questions, whether you are a PAP MP, an opposition MP, or an NMP. To enable me and my cabinet to render account to Parliament and clear the air. In my ministerial statement, I have fully addressed the allegations of abuse of power. In his ministerial statement, DPM Teo Chi Hien has explained the ministerial committee and how we uphold the integrity of the government. I brought the matter to Parliament because I'm answerable to MPs and to Singaporeans. I've opened myself up to questioning by members. It's the members' responsibility to ask me any question they want and get to the bottom of the issue. So I was surprised that some members asked me why I had brought this to Parliament and questioned if we should discuss this in Parliament. I agree that we should not fight private disputes in Parliament, nor have we done so. But grave accusations of abuse of power have been made against me as PM and against my government. Doubts have been cast on our government and the leadership. How can my ministers and I not discuss them in Parliament? Imagine the scandal if MPs filed parliamentary questions on these accusations and the government replied that Parliament is not the place to discuss the matter. So whatever else I or the government may or may not do to deal with this matter, we have to come to Parliament to render account. It is our duty. Therefore, I'm glad that in the last two days we've had a good debate. Members, PAP and non-PAP MPs have raised questions and my ministers have answered them and given a proper account. What has been the outcome? Over the past two days, the allegations about me abusing power which prompted the sitting have been answered. No MPs have produced or alleged any additional facts or charges or substantiated any of the allegations. Mr. Lo Tiakyang talks about scattered evidence centered on family displeasure, but he has not accused the government of anything, nor has he given any concrete evidence or cited any. Mr. Ping Huat read out the litany of allegations by my siblings, but he didn't endorse them, and that's significant because it shows that the government and I have acted properly and with due process, and that there is no basis to the allegations of power made by my siblings, Dr. Li Wei Ling and Mr. Li Xian Yang. My ministers have, in the course of the debate, dealt with most of the questions and points raised by the MPs. I would like to deal with just a few questions. Firstly, the Attorney General's chambers. Secondly, whether I deceive my father, Thirdly, whether I considered or am considering the legal options. And finally, where do we go next? So, AG's chambers. Ms. Sylvia Lim and several of her Workers' Party colleagues have raised questions about the propriety of appointing Mr. Lucien Wong as Attorney General and Mr. Hri Kumar as Deputy Attorney General. Because Lucien Wong was previously my lawyer, and Hri Kumar was a PAP MP. Uh, SMS Indrani Raja gave a clear reply yesterday. It's perfectly normal for lawyers to have existing clients and connections and to encounter potential conflicts of interest when they change jobs. In fact, lawyers with no clients and connections probably have no job. But the way to deal with this is also quite standard for the lawyers to recuse themselves when matters come up which they had previously dealt with in a previous capacity. The rules are quite clear. All professional lawyers know how to handle such matters. And every time a person, a lawyer, moves from, being, from practice 
onto the bench to become a judge, the judge has to do the same because he has old cases. The cases may appear before the courts and he cannot participate in the cases when they turn up before the courts. So there's no problem of conflict at all for Lucien Wong or Hri Kumar to become AG and Deputy AG. If matters come up which they had previously handled as private lawyers, they just recuse themselves and let others deal with it. And so it is with a dispute with my siblings on the house. Lucien Wong was my lawyer. But now he is the AG. I've lost a good lawyer. He's not advising me anymore on this matter. And, and in the AGC, the government cannot use Lucien Wong either to advise it on this matter because he's conflicted. He used to represent me. So on this matter, another officer in AGC takes charge. Lucien Wong is out of it. When Lucien Wong's name came up as a candidate to succeed Mr. V.K. Raja as AG, I endorsed him with confidence. He is known as one of Singapore's top lawyers and has a high international reputation, especially in corporate and banking law. I was even more confident because I had had direct personal experience working with him on this case, my personal case. I had also consulted him informally on government matters before when we were working on the points of agreement dispute with Malaysia. And I knew he was a very good lawyer. And everyone involved in the appointment was fully aware that this was the basis on which I was recommending him. I told them, I told the cabinet, Lucien is my lawyer, he's a very good lawyer. But the opposition will make an issue of this, but I do not consider this an impediment because there's no difficulty of conflict of interest. I recommend him. The AG's appointment has to be confirmed, approved by the President. I briefed the President before the matter formally went to him, and I told him the same thing. He consulted the CPA. The CPA recommended that he approve the appointment. He did. And indeed, after the President approved Lucien Wong's appointment, and it was announced, the Law Society welcomed it. Likewise, my direct knowledge of Hri Kumar as an MP and a lawyer gave me confidence that he would make a good Deputy Attorney General. I know he has a good legal mind and he has a good heart as an MP for people. It is critical for Singapore to have a strong Attorney General's chambers and for the AGC to have a strong top leadership. Because the AG is a very important and demanding job, as Workers' Party MPs have themselves pointed out. It's very difficult to find people of the right caliber and range of experience. You can take my word for it. I've been involved doing this, looking for suitable people to be attorneys general for quite a long time. And I've had to do it several times. It's important that we get the best that are there to become the Attorney General. The role is becoming more complex and we need the most capable people to defend our interests. You just look at Pedra Branca. You would have thought the matter was settled nine and a half years ago. No. Four days ago on the 30th of June, Malaysia filed an application over the ICJ judgment on Pedra Branca. We are confident of our case. We think the Malaysian case has no merit. But unless we have a top-notch team, we may mishandle the case with very serious consequences. Do you want to take a chance? We have also outstanding officers within the AG's chambers coming up the ranks. And we've promoted them within AGC. We've elevated some of them to the bench. For example, that they are deputy at this the Deputy Attorney General, Mr. Lionel Yi. There are two solicitors, solicitors General, Mr. Quick Min Luck and Ms. Mavis Jong, all promoted to their positions recently. And other career legal service officers have been elevated to the bench to become judicial commissioners 
in the first in the first as a first step, like Pang Kang Chao, Edith Abdullah, Hu Xiaoping, Audrey Lim. So we look for talent and we groom and develop talent within, but at the same time we seek to reinforce the AG's chambers with lawyers from the private sector. Because they will both reinforce the team and add to the talent pool, and also the AGC can benefit from their experience with private sector work. We have a good team in the AGC today. They hold their own with the very best to fight for Singapore's interests abroad. They pursue cases in court and handle very complicated cases professionally, competently, where necessary, aggressively. And the appointments of Lucien Wong and Hri Kumar will contribute to building this team and make the AG's chambers an even stronger institution. Now let me turn to a few of the points which have to do with Oxley Road, starting with what Ms. Cheng Li Hui asked just now, whether I deceived my father and made him believe that the house was gazetted. I think when, you, when the allegation is that you have deceived Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and is directed at the Prime Minister, that can never be a private allegation. I mean, it has enormous ramifications for my standing and reputation, and the matter has to be answered. The simple answer is that I didn't deceive my father. I explained to you yesterday how my father's primary wish on the house has always been clear. He always wanted it knocked down. Where my siblings and I differ is on whether my father was prepared to consider alternatives should demolition not be possible. After meeting Cabinet on the 21st of July 2011, my, Mr. Lee asked me for my view of what the government would do with the House after he died. I gave him my honest assessment. I told him, you've met the Cabinet. You've heard the Minister's views. If I chair the Cabinet meeting, given that these are the views of the Ministers and the public, I think it would be very hard for me to override them and knock the House down. I would have to agree that the House has to be gazetted, to be kept. And if I'm not the PM, or I don't chair the meeting, all the more likely that the House will be gazetted. He understood. In August 2011, about a month later, he decided to will the House to me, as I told you yesterday, and he told the family. Ho Ching and I knew my father's wishes and also my mother's feelings on the House and we wanted to address their concerns should demolition not be allowed. So we came up with a proposal to renovate the house, to change the inside completely, to demolish the private spaces, but keep the historic basement dining room. And my wife kept the whole family comprehensively informed. Madam Speaker, may I ask the clerk now to distribute the handout to members? Yes, please. I'm distributing two family emails just to give you a sense of the conversation and the discussions and how they were conducted. The first email is dated 2nd January 2012, and it's from Ho Ching to my father. In fact, it's to the whole family, Li Wei Ling, Li Xian Yang, Li Kuan Yu, Li Xian Lung, Li Xiuet Fun to keep the whole family informed on what, our, what we were doing. It's a long email. I will just take you through the beginning and the end. It says, hi, Ling, just to update you on one of the ideas for Oxley Renewal Development. As Lung mentioned, the first preference is to demolish the Oxley House and build afresh. The next best alternative is to renovate and redevelop parts of the house or annex so that it is livable, rentable for many more years, but with a new internal layout. The renovation renewal idea is to keep or renew the main Oxley House structure 
retaining its old world ambiance, but completely changing the internal layout except for the basement dining room and redeveloping the back annex into a two-storey annex connected to the main house. Thus, the current primary private family living spaces in the main house upstairs will be gone and family privacy protected. And then there's a long description of all the different possibilities, including, and then we come to the conclusion on the second page. If there's objection to renting out to, say, expats, then the family could consider moving in, at least for the initial years. And then Link can use one of the big bedrooms and so forth, where, who can go where. Wei Wei, that's the architect, has done various projects, including the renewal of Victoria Theatre, as well as conservation of private dwellings. And as, as, as he explained, the conservation requirements typically do not mean preserving the house in its entirety. The interior layouts are often changed to reflect new family usage needs. So we have the option of redoing the entire interior layout to remove any linkages back to the private family space. Thanks. So that's the first email. I give you a second email, which is 30th of April, 2012. That means about four months later. From my wife, Ho Ching, to my father, again copied to the whole family, to say that the approvals have been secured and will be delivered to him. And please let her know anything else needs to be done. And he replied about three hours later, noted nothing to follow up or to sign by me. Permission has been granted, as I had previously signed in letters to them. We'll send them to you. So you see, it's quite clear, it's quite open. It's not very curt. The conservation plan was done honestly, transparently, and not on false pretenses. After my father died, I said in Parliament on the 13th of April 2015, as I recounted yesterday, that the government will take no decision on the house so long as my sister was living in it. Why did I do that? Because people were then, three weeks after his passing, still very emotional over losing Ms. Lee Kuan Yew. Some wanted to honour him by keeping the house. Others wanted to honour him by knocking the house down. Emotions were high. Whichever decision we made, one way or the other, significant numbers of people would be upset and you're just creating tensions and unhappiness and anxieties for nothing. Best if we postpone this major decision for a calmer time let time pass before we come to the matter. That's why I said what I did in Parliament. And I see it in no way contradicting my father's wishes or what I had advised my father when he was alive. Now, many members have asked me other specific questions on matters after my father died. Ms. Sun Xueling was unsure why I had offered to transfer the house to my sister for $1, but subsequently sold it to Li Xian Yang at market value. Mr. Henry Quick asked why I had not raised matters on the will during probate, and why I'm expressing concern now and have put my views in the form of statutory declarations. And several members have suggested that I take legal action to clear my name and put a stop to the matter once for all. Let me explain my overall approach to handling this family matter. And to do so, I beg your indulgence, Madam Speaker, but I do have to go a little bit into the family history. It's a complicated story, but one golden thread running through it, right from the beginning, is my desire to manage the issue privately without escalating the temperature and the dispute, and without forcing the issue of my legal rights. I adopted this approach because it involves family, and I was hoping all along to work out an amicable resolution, even if that meant compromising some of my own interests. When I learned from others who were meant to tell me that my siblings were unhappy that my father had willed me the house, I tried to resolve the unhappiness. 
So in May 2015, I offered to transfer the house to my sister for a nominal sum of $1. She'd been living there for some time, in fact, all her life, except when she was abroad and small gaps. And my father had wanted her to continue living in the house after he died, if she wished to. So it was natural to let her own the house. I only asked for one condition, that if the property was sold later or acquired by the government, that the proceeds would be donated to charity. I thought it was a very reasonable offer. My brother wanted in on the deal. He wanted to join in and jointly buy the house with my sister from me for one dollar. My sister had no objection, so I agreed to this. But during the discussions, disagreement arose. My siblings started making allegations about me and escalating them. So I told them they would have to stop attacking me if they wanted the deal done, because otherwise, if I transfer the house to them and the quarrel continues, there's no point. And they wanted me to give a certain undertaking. I won't go into all the details now, but I could not agree to what they asked for, so we were at an impasse. We went back and forth for several months. Every few weeks, my letter would go to them. They would think about it every few weeks. Their lawyer would reply to my lawyer, and so we continued the discussion. Faced with these allegations, I reviewed my old family emails. Kwa Kim Lee was my father's lawyer before his last will. She did not do his last will. But she sent me and my siblings information about the previous wills of my father, and also information about what she knew about the last will. Only then did I understand what had happened before my father died and became troubled by how the last will had been done. But I still held back from raising the issue with my siblings because I still hoped for an amicable settlement. In August 2015, I dissolved Parliament and called the general election. My siblings then issued me an ultimatum to accept their terms by the 1st of September 2015, which, perhaps coincidentally, was nomination day. I told them I was very busy. They would surely understand that I had many things on my plate, and I would respond as soon as the elections were over, which I did. I could not allow myself, the government, or the PAP to be intimidated by such threats. I decided to ask my siblings to clarify the circumstances surrounding the last will. After that, for whatever reason, the 1st September deadline passed uneventfully. After the election, I again tried to settle the matter. I told my siblings that we were not getting anywhere on the $1 offer, with the conditions on what each side could do or say, so I made them a fresh offer forget all the previous discussions, new offer. No conditions on what we can do or say, but I will sell the house to my brother at full market value. And the only condition which is attached now is that we each donate half the value to charity. And then you do and say what you think fit, and I am free to be my own person. I, I am not constrained in any way. And I offered this arrangement which involved the donation to charity. Because it was a variation that we had discussed before Mr. Lee died, but ultimately had not adopted. So we said, well, if you want to settle the matter, there was this old variation. Would you like to take it up now? He took it. We signed. And that was December 2015. Again, I hope that this would settle the problem and we could keep the matter low-key and perhaps gradually subsiding. Later on, when the ministerial committee asked for views from my siblings and me, I wrote in to give my views. So did my siblings. We both commented on each other's views. My siblings had put a lot of weight on the first part of the demolition clause in the last will. So I felt the need 
to explain the circumstances surrounding the preparation of the last will to the ministerial committee so that they would understand how, what to make of the evidence. And because of the gravity of the matter, I voluntarily made my submissions to the ministerial committee in the form of sworn statutory declarations, or as they say in the coffee shops, sumpa. That means if what I have put down is proven to be false, I can go to jail for perjury. The statements cannot be taken back. They are done, sworn, irrevocable. But I did this privately because it was just to inform the committee in their deliberations, and I did not want to escalate the quarrel. Unfortunately, at 2 a.m. on the 14th of June this year, my siblings made public allegations against me. I was forced to respond. I decided to put out the facts and I released a summary of my statutory declarations. Again, in the first instance, I did not take the legal route and sue for defamation. I stand by what I swore in the SDs and published in the statement. But really, I don't want to go further along this way if I can help it. I did not and still do not want to escalate the quarrel. At each point, I decided not to try to enforce my full legal rights. My priority was to resolve the matter privately and avoid a collision. Some MPs still ask why I'm not taking legal action against my siblings. For example, Mr. Lo Tiakyang advocates my suing my siblings for defamation. And this background which I have narrated to you explains why I have hesitated to do so. As I said yesterday, I've been advised that I have a strong legal case, and in normal circumstances, I would surely sue because the accusations of abuse of power are so grave. But suing my own brother and sister in court would further besmirch our parents' names. Mr. Lowe may think that doesn't count and is neither here nor there. I take a different view. Mr. Lowe argued that we should do whatever it takes to bring the issue to a quick resolution. I agree. But going to court will not achieve this. It will drag out the process for years, cause further distress to Singaporeans, and distract us from the many urgent issues that, that we must deal with. Several MPs, Mr. Pritam Singh, Ms. Kwik Xiaoyin, Mr. Louis Ng, Mr. Zaki Mohammad, suggested a select committee or a commission of inquiry as an alternative. But what's the basis for this? There are no specifics to the headline charge of abuse of power. What specifically did I do that was wrong? And what was wrong with that, whatever that may be? Who was involved? When did it happen? After two days of debate, nobody has stood behind these allegations or offered any evidence, not even opposition MPs. The Workers' Party MPs say they're not in a position to judge. Indeed, Mr. Lowe criticizes my siblings for making vague allegations based on scattered evidence centered on family displeasure. If MPs believe that something is wrong, it's MPs' job to pursue the facts and make these allegations in their own name. Decide whether something seems to be wrong. And if you think something is wrong, even if you are not fully sure, then come to this House, confront the government, ask for explanations and answers. If, having heard the government, you are not satisfied, then by all means demand a select committee or a commission of inquiry. But do not just repeat allegations and attribute them to others, or ask for a select committee or COI because accusations are around, don't know what, but therefore we must have a COI to find out what. The accusers may not be in Parliament. But that should not stop MPs from talking to them to get their story. Nor, should it stop, nor would it stop the accusers from getting in touch with MPs, including opposition MPs, 
to tell their story so that the MPs can raise it on their behalf in Parliament. That is, in fact, how the MP system is meant to work. Those are the MPs' duties. And that's one reason why parliamentary privilege exists, so that MPs can, who have heard troubling allegations or news, can make these allegations and raise the matters in the House, even if they are not completely proven and may be defamatory, without fear of being sued for defamation. And that's how parliaments are supposed to function. But none of this has happened over the last two days. No one says there's evidence of abuse of power. Even the opposition is not accusing the government of abuse of power. So it is not a case of oneself defend oneself. Why do we need, in these circumstances, a select committee or a COI and drag this out for months? It'll be another Korean drama full-scale serial. Should we set up select committees to investigate every unsubstantiated allegation, every wild rumour? It's, as Mr Lotia Kyang says, vague allegations. Vague allegations based on scattered evidence centred on family displeasure as a basis for, for ordering a select committee or a COI. That's not a basis. But if there is evidence of wrongdoing which emerges, or alleged evidence of wrongdoing which emerges, then I and the government will consider what further steps to take. We can have a select committee. We can have a commission of inquiry. I may decide to sue for defamation or take some other legal action. But until then, let's get back to more important things that we should be working on. Where do we go from here? The ministerial statements and the debate have been important, valuable. Facts and explanations have been put on the record. Singaporeans have received a full account of how the government works and what the government has done in the case of 38 Oxley Road. The allegations have been aired, have been answered, rebutted, and people can see that there has been no abuse of power by me or the government. I hope that this two-day debate has cleared the air and will calm things down. It would be unrealistic to hope that the matter is now completely put to rest. I do not know what further statements or allegations my siblings may make. But with the benefit of the statements and debate in Parliament, Singaporeans are now in a better position to judge the facts and see the issue in perspective. And we can all go back to what we should be focused on and not be distracted from national priorities and responsibilities. I thank ESM Go Chok Tong, Ms. Chia Yong Yong, Mr. Charles Chong, and many others for your good wishes for reconciliation within the family. I, would, I too would like to think this is possible. It will be a difficult and long road, but I hope that one day there will be rapprochement. DPMTO reminded us about the National Week of Mourning when Mr. Lee died. It was an emotional week for everybody, for Singaporeans who lost their founding father, for my family, and for me. For me, the most difficult and emotional moment in that whole week came when I was reading the eulogy at the state funeral service. When I recounted how, when I was about 13, my father had told me, if anything happens to me, please take care of your mother and your younger sister and brother. Singapore was then part of Malaysia. We were in a fierce fight 
with the central government and the communists. My father didn't tell me, but he knew his life was in danger. Fortunately, nothing happened to my father then. He brought up the family, and I thought we had a happy family, and he lived a long and full life. Little did I expect that after my parents died, these tensions would erupt with such grievous consequences. And after so many years, I would be unable to fulfill the role which my father had hoped I would. So I hope one day these passions will subside and we can begin to reconcile. At the very least, I hope that my siblings will not visit their resentments and grievances with one generation onto the next, upon the next generation. And further, that they do not transmit their enmities and feuds to our children. I'm sad that this episode has happened. I regret that in addressing public accusations against me, I've had to talk about private family matters in Parliament. My purpose has not been to pursue a family fight, but to clear the air and to restore public confidence in our system. This is how the system is supposed to work when there are questions and doubts about the government, we bring them up, deal with them openly, clear the doubts. If anything is wrong, we must put it right. If nothing is wrong, we must say so. Ms. Chia Yongyong spoke eloquently yesterday of the many issues she felt passionately about, the many challenges we face as a nation, and why we should be focusing on them and not being distracted by this controversy. Mr. Lo Tiakyang called on everyone to focus on rallying Singaporeans to be united in facing the challenges and not be participating in a divisive dispute. I fully agree with them. We must all get back to work. This is not soap opera. Come together, tackle the challenges before us. My team and I will do our best to continue building this Singapore, keeping it safe, making it prosper. Thank you very much.